Custom code is the ability to add any custom script that you want to your Agora World plugins or to the worlds that you upload. Uh, in this tutorial, we'll show you the basics as well as try to, uh, you know, live coding, we haven't created this plugin before, make a pet follow plugin. Um, these, we're not gonna go into the world plugins, but it, the principles are basically the exact same. Um, we're just gonna apply it on the plugin side. So first thing we're gonna do, uh, this was from our last tutorial, so delete that. We have our empty scene. Um, our goal is to make a pets um, plugin. So we're gonna go ahead and make a new folder in assets for our plugin called pets. Uh, under there, we need our prefabs folder. We're inevitably gonna need a uh, materials folder. Oops, that's a material, we need a folder. And we are also going to need an assembly definition file. This one is very much needed for uh, custom code to work. It's essentially the backbone of custom code. The way that custom code in Agora works at the moment is that you have a DLL, maybe in the future multiple DLLs, which are prepackaged code libraries and you are able to upload that uh, with your plugin or your world. And then on the uh, client side, the, the Agora app side, um, any plugins that are added to a world are then downloaded and loaded. Um, there's a lot of considerations with this. Um, one of the main ones being, at least at this time, mobile will, will not support, um, at least on the iOS side, um, this type of thing. We don't currently support iOS um, or any uh, mobile at the moment, but you know, just looking forward, that is a consideration. Um, the places that, you know, this for sure supports is native Mac and Windows. Um, and we are also working hard to make sure that the support will be there for the WebGL version that we're, we're working on. Um, we can't guarantee the WebGL version will work because there's still a lot of questions there, um, but that is the goal. Um, there might be some things that aren't compatible, but overall, I think it is possible to make stuff work. Um, so that's just a note on that. Um, one of the things to also be aware of is that because we are allowing you to write custom code and you know basically anything you can do with a computer is available to you, um, that means that there are security considerations. Um, you can totally write a virus with this and deploy that and uh, people who download the plugin will get your virus. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it's really up to you as the developer to be responsible and to be developing things that are not um, malicious and that are not um, super uh, vulnerable to exploit. Um, we're, we're kind of giving you uh, the full freedom there. And that is kind of the, the choice we've made. If you need a platform that's, you know, way more secure, um, then you just need to disable custom code um, for your events that you use. I never use custom code plugins. Um, we require also, the other note is that we require users um, when they join a world that has custom code to opt in and say, yes, I understand that this is custom code and I accept that um, I trust this developer, this experience creator. Um, so those are just some notes of custom code. It's very much still in the early days for us on that, um, but you can do a lot with it. I mean, it's basically anything you can program, you can make happen now in Agora. So um, I think that, that power is gonna uh, be very valuable for a lot of people. Um, but enough about that, let's get into the meat of how to do this. So we have our folder here for the pets. I'm gonna go ahead and create the assembly definition definition that we need. So let's create assembly definition. Uh, we're gonna name this Agora Tutorial Pets. And we have this object here, it's got pets um, in its name. And um, this essentially will say that any code file that we have that's underneath this uh, folder will now be part of this assembly and the other code is not going to get packaged with it. Um, so we can have other code in our project, it's off doing whatever it's doing, but only the code that is in Agora Tutorial Pets will get added um, to our plugin when we decide to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and make a script folder. And before we make our first script, let's just make a couple objects that we're gonna need. Um, so the first one is just gonna be a, a basic cube here. Um, this is going to be pet spawner. And 
We are gonna make that into a sandbox item and a prefab. Then we're gonna have another object that is going to be a capsule. This is gonna be our pet 01. And maybe just so we know which way it's facing, we'll give it some eyes. Changing the scale here. Whenever you're in doubt about an object, you can check which way it's facing with this arrow here. So that's its uh, that's the forward direction, assuming that we're in local mode, yep. And global is the same. And then we can go ahead and move this eye to its front. Uh, we'll need to make a eye material for it. Duplicate it, move it over here, and then give it a color that is a little bit more interesting. Black, sure, why not? Um, to make it interesting, we'll give this a different color uh, for the body. All right, kind of looks like a banana, but <laughs> we'll just leave it how it is. Um, obviously, the art of our pet can change over time, um, but good enough for now. Uh, note, we did not make this a sandbox item. This is going to be something that we spawn. Um, and yeah, it's not a sandbox item. Now that we have our objects, let's go ahead and create a script. Create a C script. We're going to call this um, Pet Spawner. We're going to attach that to our pets, Pet Spawner uh, object after it loads there, which we should now see it here. Yep. And open that script up. Uh, I use an IDE called writer. Um, it's a, a paid uh, IDE um, and essentially uh, any C Sharp code editor will work um, with Unity, but I uh, assume the other common ones are going to be Visual Studio um, or Visual Studio Code. Um, whatever you're using, it should all work fairly similarly, um, just some small differences. Um, but for this, essentially what I'm going to do, I have this pet spawner script here. Uh, in the start function, I am going to call, um, let's see, what should we do? Just just as something that we can do that will show us that our plugin is, is uploading correctly, we're gonna use you know, something very s simple to start. And that simple thing is to spawn our object. So before I go ahead and do that, I actually wanna import um, an example script uh, uh, that we have called Deathmatch that shows what a first person shooter looks like. Um, as a plugin, and that's going to have some code I'm going to draw from just to figure out how to build uh, build this pet follower script and, and the pet spawning. So I go here, our documentation page, um, and then also, by the way, you can access this also from here. And then once I'm on our documentation page, I'm going to go ahead and go to this custom code deathmatch example. download it, run it, import, and then under this dev testing files, we see deathmatch, we see scripts, and then the thing I'm looking for is the deathmatch manager. And then once you have that opened up, you, you know, in your own time, you can look at the script, um, there's lots going on here. We're not going to go through this. That, that's got its own tutorial um, and, and really it's more of an example to look through. Um, but the thing I'm looking for is how to spawn a networked object. So we can see here uh, the, the spawning uh, behavior of how to do that. Um, I'm going to copy over the code and then I'll explain kind of what it's doing. So first thing I'm going to do is create a game object called pet. 
Uh, this is my pet. And then we also need a object called um, uh, pet prefab. Now, the way that this code is working, we'll edit this as we go. First of all, we have this network manager called um, iNetwork Manager, um, and that is achieved by, or is, is pulled by getting this SDK Objects Manager instance. Um, we also have the avatar reference, which we may uh, or may not end up using. Um, this now is supposed to be my pet. So my pet is equal to uh, network manager dot network instantiate. And then when we, whenever we spawn a networked object, because we, we don't want just us to see our pet, we want everybody to see our pet. Um, so in order to do that, we have to call the network manager, network instantiate, and then in that we're passing this sandbox helper function, which basically helps us get um, our object. I realize we actually are going to make a modification here. This is not a mono behavior. This is a, a class deriving from sandbox item SDK. Uh, and that the reason we need that is that that gives us access to this plugin key, which is needed in order to spawn networked objects. Um, we're going to remove that other one that we added earlier. Uh, this is essentially has all the functionality of, of a sandbox item, but then we're extending it to, to be custom. Um, we also need to pass in the, the string name of the, the prefab that we're trying to spawn. So this would be pet prefab.name. Um, and then we can also choose the position to spawn it at. Um, I think for now we don't need to do that. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, remove some of these things. Uh, it, it can spawn, I guess. It doesn't matter where it spawns. We're just trying to make sure that it spawns and we can see where it spawns. So we'll, we'll, we'll spawn it based on the avatar position at the moment, but that will probably change. And then um, the rest of this code is not needed for um, our current purposes. Okay, so yeah, really simple script. We've got our derivative of sandbox item SDK. Um, we've got a pet prefab, we've got my pet. This actually could be private for now. Um, and then we're spawning the object and it'll spawn and we'll, we'll see it somewhere in the uh, environment. So let's go ahead and save all. Actually, there's one last thing we almost missed. Um, this will work, but we really highly, highly, highly encourage you to use namespaces because if you don't, then people using plugins can have conflicts. Um, even with namespaces right now, there can be conflicts, but we're working to see if there's a way to uh, make that not happen. But namespaces are gonna greatly decrease the chance of conflicts. Basically what I mean by namespace is you just say namespace and then you name it. In this case, our namespace that we wanted is, a, a what is it? It's Agora Tutorial Pets. So our namespace is Agora Tutorial Pets. And then you just go ahead and, and copy paste all this under the namespace. And now, unless somebody else names their plugin Agora Tutorial Pets, there's not gonna be any naming conflict with this pet spawner um, object. So you can imagine with certain script names that are, are possibly gonna get reused or be common among different plugins, um, the namespaces ensure that as long as nobody names your their plugin the same thing as you, um, that you're not going to have conflicts. Eventually, we are aimed to to do some things to uh, make that even less likely. Uh, like even if somebody had the same namespace um, and the same script name, there are still there are ways out there to potentially have conflicts not happen. But it's going to be time consuming to figure that out, and we're you know moving quickly here. So uh, for now, just use a namespace, and you'll be good to go. And you just put that. Basically, any script that you write as part of this plugin, you just put that on the outside of the class. All right, so saving. Uh, double check that we have our item configured correctly. So we've got our pet 
yep, this is a simple object. We're not doing anything with it yet. And we've got our pet spawner. The pet spawner has two sandbox item SDKs now because remember this derives, this pet spawner derives from sandbox item SDK. So now there's two instances, which is gonna mess things up. So what we wanna do is we wanna remove one. And we also wanna fill this uh, reference to our pet that we want to spawn, like that. Okay, so now if we go ahead and go to the world um, plugin SDK, um, and then we hit create new plugin, we're gonna call this Agora Tutorial Pets. And then drag in the prefab uh, thing here. Uh, we have an image, yeah, snowflake, good old snowflake. And we're gonna name this, have a friend follow you, okay. So note that this pet here does not need to have a sandbox item SDK attached. Um, prefabs can not, you can have prefabs that are not sandbox item SDK. The only thing that a plugin absolutely needs to have is at least one sandbox item SDK um, or, or der derived from sandbox item SDK um, script in it. Otherwise it will not work. But we've got our pet spawner, so our plugin is working and we should be able to just upload. Now, if you've been paying attention, you might be wondering if something went wrong and you are right. And the thing that I forgot to do is that you need to actually assign the code that you want uh, uploaded. And um, the reason we do this is like, you know, you might decide to not have custom code um, as part of your plugin. And um, it's much more secure, like custom code, as soon as you introduce it has that potential uh, uh, security vulnerability of, you know, you can do anything with it as a developer. And so um, there's two things to keep in mind. One is that in order to uh, uh, upload custom code to Agora, you need to have a pro account at the very least, uh, which is the $10 a month tier. Um, if you do not have a paid account, you are not able to upload custom code and you will get an error um, and it will just not work. Um, we're doing that not just to make money, but also because it does increase the security of at least we have some idea of who is uploading the code. And if there's like, you know, something malicious uploaded, then there's at least somebody to point to um, in, in that case versus just a free user could be anybody. Um, so if you do want to do custom code, you are and want to play with it, you are going to need to get the pro subscription. Um, and yeah, that's just a note there. Um, so. Assuming that you are a paying user, um, congratulations, you can now upload custom code. Um, and in order to do that, the easiest way is you hit that select DLL button and you find your, um, you're gonna start probably in the assets folder. So you wanna actually click out to um, the project folder. You wanna click into your library, find your script assemblies, and then you wanna find this uh, whatever you named your, your DLL um, assembly definition. In our case, Agora Tutorial Pets, only four kilobytes, very, uh, very small still with only uh, a single script. And hit apply and it will um, select it. And then we can go ahead and, and update our, our uh, plugin to have the custom code. All right, it's uploaded. Plugin upload finished. So we know it worked, there's no play play mode blue, so we're, we're good. Um, and we can also see that, you know, all the files that we would expect, including the DLL, got uploaded. So in order to test this now, I'm gonna go ahead into my experiences, uh, you know, open Agora, sign in if you haven't already. Um, going to hit uh, the tutorial uh, that we've been messing with so far. Um, going to edit in world. We're now here in this world. I'm gonna add the plugin now that we just created. Agora Tutorial Pets, we've got our one object. And you'll get this warning that, hey, there's been a plugin out with custom code. So anybody who's in this world editing with you, um, if you decide to add custom code, they are gonna get this warning message. And if they hit lead, they will leave the instance, they will not download anything. If they hit continue, that is when they will download the custom code. So this is a security precaution. We don't want people to just be able to suddenly, you know, virus bomb. Um, the only person who can add plugins right now is the host of the experience. So 
um, generally you'd probably only be joining a host that you trust anyways, but you know, people are going to uh, do what they're going to do in terms of joining uh, rooms and stuff. So uh, this is an extra step of security that we have in place that you're never going to download anything uh, without opting in basically. Um, the downside of this is that if you then do this and the person hasn't accepted it, like they leave and come back, um, they may have some desync happen. And, and the way that they fix that would, they would just have to leave the room and then come back um, and everything would be working again. So we have our um, tutorial pets here. And then in theory, when I spawn this object, we should see another object spawn. Um, and so let's see if it happens. Oh, it definitely happened because I got moved and there it is. It spawned on my left hand, uh, it has a collider so it moved me a little bit, and we have our pet spawning. That's awesome. So now what we need to do, uh, and one thing to keep in mind is this is, is uh, single player right now. So at the end, if we have time, we will do some multiplayer testing. But basically, um, every user who joins this room now, when this cube is in here, is going to have um, this object spawn um, on start at their location. So this object is actually not even uh, networked at the moment. I'm fairly certain um, it, it does not have network objects on it because uh, we haven't added them yet. We're going to get to that though. We're going to also make it uh, follow us. But as you can see, we were able to write custom code and that custom code is now in Agora and causing things to happen. So. Uh, if that was all you were coming to this tutorial for, then that's awesome. Uh, you're good to go make custom code. But if you want to see a little bit more about uh, making custom code plugin uh, with uh, pet, you know, in this case, following pet, and just some more complex behavior with networking, I think that it's worth staying on. So back in Unity, we uh, check our inspector here on the pet. And we're spawning this object with our network instantiate function, but we actually don't have any um, network behavior on it. So in order to actually add that, we're going to need a component called network view. So when you add this network view to an object, it makes it so that it's uh, network aware and we can actually set what we want it to track. Um, generally, the defaults are good. Uh, you should yeah, be good just leaving the defaults, but you are able to change them uh, if you're trying to make things more optimized or um, switch around some stuff. Um, you have the freedom to do that. But in our case, we just wanted a network view on here so that the transform rotation and scale are um, basically, or yeah, the position rotation scale are all tracked. Um, and so if this object moves, whoever the owner of this object is, is gonna drive how the movement happens for every user. Um, so we have that on there now, it's gonna spawn. And then if we move this object on the owner um, client, then it will, um, it'll, it'll move around. Uh, the thing that we need to do though, is to open the pet spawner script and we actually need to change this start function to, uh, nothing because actually, yeah, no, it's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, there is a thing with, uh, start where if there's an object that's getting spawned multiple times, then you may want to put on enable. But because this is designed, at least right now, to only have a single pet, um, we're fine with leaving it in start. Um, so this is gonna go ahead and spawn an object for every user who joins. So every user gets a pet, essentially. Um, now, the thing that we wanna do is we wanna have the pet follow and we want to, um, yeah, we want, we want the pet to follow that user. So. Let's go ahead and do a couple things. The first one is we're gonna store the, fo the follow point essentially um, that we want the pet to follow. Then in our initialize function, we're gonna set that follow point. So the way we set this up is we want basically the pet to follow the scene camera. That's essentially the player's view. Um, you know, we could, there's a number of things we could choose here. We could choose it to follow the avatar. Um, the reason we're choosing the scene camera is that it's a local only um, object, which means you're not going to deal with weird um, 
like glitchy movement, um, it's going to be as basically as smooth as it, as it can be um, if we follow this, the camera. And um, it only exists on the local player's machine. Um, so we have our follow point. Um, now what we need to do is we need to actually write some follow code. There's a lot of ways we can do this. This is where, you know, the the art and, and game development side of, of creating a pet um, plugin comes into play. Uh, I think we'll start with something probably pretty uh, straightforward and simple. And then if we have some time, we'll iterate on it. Um, but essentially uh, what I want it to do is to follow, to move towards that point and stop if it gets too close. So maybe I'll write the, the stopping code first and uh, go from there. So this piece of code is checking the distance between the follow point and the pet. Um, if it is closer than one meter, then we're gonna do something else, we'll do something else. Um, actually, if it's closer, if it's if it's closer to one meter, we want to do nothing, so we can just say do nothing. That's just a comment, so we we know that this is intentionally left blank. Um, else, um, if it's not less than a meter away, then we want it to move towards um, us, and we'll probably set some values here for speed and, and things like that, so our pet you know can only go so fast. Um, so maybe let's start with the speed value up at the top here. We'll start with a speed of six um, for now, and that's something obviously that can be adjusted. The pet speed should be, um, so let's see, this is, Okay, so what we've gone ahead and done here is we've calculated the direction, which is the far point uh, minus the close point. Um, and then we are taking the transform of the pet and we're saying, hey, take the current transform position and then add onto that transform uh, position the vector of the direction normalized, which means that we're removing any magnitude. So it doesn't matter how far away the a person is, um, it's still going to move the same speed. We may decide that we, out of as a design decision, we may decide to remove that. Um, but for now, I think it makes sense so that it's always uh, going to be a constant speed. And then we have our speed value. And then we need to have, because we're an update, uh, time to delta time. This ensures that if somebody has faster frame rate, they don't, their pet doesn't move quicker. Um, things basically stay consistent that way. Um, and so yeah, that's essentially the, the follow code, at least version one of it. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with this to make it look better. Uh, one thing I'm immediately uh, you know, aware of is that this has nothing uh, to do with rotation. Um, so there's no like rotation code here. So may maybe for now we can do something simple, like just to have the pet uh, face towards us. Um, so something like that would be... Uh, my pet transform look at follow point. So the pet's always going to look at us. Um, you know, with more time, you would do it, you know, some smooth looking. So it's not always just staring directly at you um, and maybe some variants and things. There's lots of things you can do. But uh, for now, it's looking at you. Now, when I wrote this, I realized I, I have a bug here. This is going to follow the transform of this uh, spawner, not of the pet. So I actually need to modify this. So we have my pet transform position. It's adding 
this should all uh, work as uh, at least we hope it works and then we'll basically have our pet follow us. Um, so let's go ahead and give it a try. I save, go back to Unity, it's gonna reload. Um, sometimes it can be nice, like if you're not sure if your script's reloaded, because sometimes, uh, depending on your, your editor, your IDE, um, it won't reload the script assembly every time. So uh, you can hit play and that will guaranteed make the script assemblies load correctly, um, or reload, I should say. Uh, but let's go ahead and update our plugin. Agora Tutorial Pets. Prefabs. We have the DLL still selected from last time, so we don't need to re-put the path in. Um, but if this had been uh, in between sessions, you would definitely need to re-equip it. And then update. So back in Unity, uh, we already have this object here. So let me go ahead and save. And then I'm gonna leave this room. And rejoin to get the new uh, behavior. This uh, may not work actually the first try, we'll see. Um, the reason it would not work is if the DLL had did not reload, um, which I've had some trouble with in the past, uh, you may have to restart. Um, but let's see. So that is there. And yeah, it's not working. And there's actually two possibilities. So first I'm gonna restart Agora um, because the DLL um, needs to get reloaded. Um, one thing though that I realized and it's probably gonna cause issues is in start, there isn't a guarantee that you have the avatar um, component yet. The avatar takes a little bit to load. And so because we're relying on this avatar, it's going to cause uh, problems. Um, so we actually do need to make a code change. Um, one way, or eventually we wanna make there uh, be a callback that you can uh, get that you're sure that everything is loaded and then you can get this avatar here. Um, but we don't actually need the avatar at all for uh, this piece of code. So gonna comment that out. Um, we can remove where uh, this gets the pet gets spawned initially. It doesn't actually. Um, actually, what we'll do is we'll just spawn it at the uh, the this particular point. So this would be uh, transfer dot position. It'll just spawn on the the spawner basically, and uh, that way, yeah, we don't have any uh, issues occur, or at least we shouldn't. then we'll just need to run a, another update. Okay. So let's try this one more time. Okay, I entered the room. Oh, <laughs> there's that little guy. Oh yeah, he's really following me close. If I sprint, you'll see he's following. Uh, shift is sprint. And uh, you'll see he comes really close to me because I, I forgot the uh, the scale of this guy is, is about um, two meters tall and about a meter-ish wide. So when he's close, he's really, really close. He's like a giant, uh, giant companion here who always stares directly at you. But that, I would say, is success. So we have our follow script. This object could obviously be anything, um, and it would still work. Uh, we'll probably make a smaller, cuter version um, of him so that we don't uh, get startled when we turn around. <laughs> uh, although that is pretty funny. And uh, he has physics, so you can see him kind of jittering after us. He's, there and um, yeah, that's uh, that is the working code. 
can even make him jump by pressing spacebar. So one last thing, I guess, before I end this tutorial video is um, just noting um, the script here one last time in case you haven't uh, caught it. Um, the thing I wanted to mention was that the reason that we put the, the logic for this on a pet spawner, so like this follow code specifically, is actually pretty arbitrary. Um, the simplest explanation for why I did this way is that it's simpler and easier to manage um, because we only have one pet per person. Um, you're able to follow it uh, there and um, not have to worry about syncing because this object, or this code I should say, because of how it's structured, it's targeting my pet and my pet is always going to only be your pet. Uh, and this is where your networking gets confusing, but basically because this code is only running locally for you, um, you it, this object exists for everybody, but the my pet is only you. So even though everybody's gonna have this update function running, it's only gonna target their pet. So everybody's managing their own pet. What gets complicated is if I was to put uh, update code on the uh, pet itself, which is something that uh, you know is generally like a decent idea to do. Keep things, you know, controlling their own destinies. Um, if you do that, then you need to have code in place that says, "Hey, this is you know this pet belongs to this person." Um, and there are ways to do that um, with with our SDK. Um, we're we're trying to work on ways to make it easier to do it. Um, but yeah, that was just a note on why we did it that way, and it just makes it simpler. Um, for this particular example. Um, I think the last thing I need to show is just it working in a multi-user environment uh, because that's the thing that you want to keep in mind is that there, this is a multi-user experience. Uh, we added that network component. Uh, as of right now, until you test network a networked uh, plugin, it, it's probably not working. Um, I think that if this is working first try, it's probably because of just the experience I've had with the SDK and networking in general. Um, and even I am surprised when things work the first time. Uh, I would say much more often I build something and I'm having to test it like 20 to 30 times uh, on a networked environment to make sure that the networking is uh, working correctly. Um, but in order to do that, um, you are going to need to have a second Agora account. Um, and so that's something you can you know, use a second email, create a second Agora account, and basically have two instances of the Agora app running at the same time. If you, Ideally, you would have two computers because when you have two instances running at the same time, there can be some file access issues, especially with Windows, where the DLLs that are custom will not run correctly. Um, so if you're trying to test locally on the same computer and things are not behaving as you would expect, I would uh, definitely check that. Um, Debugging, you know, something that we're, we're going to try to make easier for, for people um, over time. Uh, unfortunately, we can't currently run Agora in the editor, so you can't like see things in the scene view or um, see uh, the errors in real time show up in the console. Um, you can, however, check once you run, obviously, the app, you can check your player log. Um, and in the player log, you're able to access uh, any of the debug logs that you've put, as well as any errors that occur. So I guess an example, um, let's go to that actually right now. So in here, if we go to users, app data, local low, uh, I have three Agora worlds. It's the one that has the comma is the Agora world main folder. Um, and then once we're in that folder, we're able to check this player log and it'll load you know, any debug logs that have happened. We have a bunch that you know our app throws, um, but basically um, you know, there's some crash reports of some things that were not working, um, you know, some debug logs that I, we have in the app and uh, sandbox data, things like that. So, um, when you're debugging, this is going to be your best bet to, to find out where things are going wrong, um, if there are errors, and um, make sure that you 
would check that. On uh, Mac, it's actually a different path. It's in your library. Um, I believe the path is library. Um, it's library followed by application support. And then if you scroll down uh, past the folders, there's a com.agora.world uh, file, I believe there. And you have to right click on it and show contents and then you'll see a similar view to this. Um, oh, actually, sorry, that's for the files. For the logs, you're gonna need to go um, into library and then logs and then Agora world uh, comma inc and then the logs should be there. Uh, that's for Mac. Um, other than logs, let's check that multiplayer actually works. So I'm going to go ahead and open two Agoras, which may, like I was saying, may, may not work with a uh, local um, two apps running, but we're going to try. Actually, yeah, the, the two apps <laughs> running locally are definitely not going to work because uh, I forgot there's a uh, like key credential stuff um, that it, like basically you're going to get signed out on, on one account. Um, so what I would say is if you're going to do multiplayer development uh, or, or plugins that require multiplayer stuff, um, I would either get a friend to help um, test with you or um, the other alternative is to run uh, run, run like, like get a second computer, like even a cheap one uh, and just run on that. Once we have WebGL uh, up and running as well, that's gonna make things a lot easier because then you'll be able to have the WebGL version run and then run your own. So just, you know, to try it out, I'm gonna actually try to to see if this works. Um, this can just publish and join. I very much did not expect this to work, but you know, we can try. I'm copying the code so that I can join here. Okay, so yeah, as I expected, I'll mute myself here. Um, as I expected, basically the uh, DLL is not gonna run uh, on two instances on the same machine. Uh, that might be something that we fix in the future, um, but for now, that's just a, a uh, constraint you're going to have to work around. So two computers or a friend with another computer will be your best bet. And then with WebGL, we'll have, that's a, a separate uh, build target. So it's, it should work fine. Um, you you are able to see this uh, little dude move around because uh, as a callback reminder, all the code right now is running locally. And the only thing that isn't local is our built-in network uh, view component. And so because that player over there is the driver for how that uh, pet moves. The uh, pet will continue to follow him because the networking uh, code there is working fine. What's not working is the DLL that we want to spawn uh, the other pet. So there should be another pet spawning here. I am certain that the issue is to do with the DLL. It's just not loading. Um, so this is an example of, yeah, you need two computers basically to test multi-user. Um, yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, let's go ahead, go back to the other instance, and our guy follows us. And let's see if he can boop with the other dude. The other dude. Yeah. So that's it for this more advanced tutorial. Uh, play around with the advanced uh, custom coding elements, and I can't wait to see what you guys make.